This is our inaugural event as we cover the O'Reilly Book Observability Engineering. And uh, we're gonna do that in a series of webinars that we're calling the Author's Cut Series. And the idea with the Author's Cut Series uh, is that uh, we, the authors, uh, can go ahead and unpack the content of several book chapters all at once. You can think of it kind of like a mini book club. Um, but in that also, we can give you uh, any and all of our takes, whether unbiased or very biased or things that couldn't fit into the book. Um, and we want to take some time to show you how some of these concepts uh, are implemented using real world examples. And typically we'll be using Honeycomb to kind of show you how some of these things come together. So today's session is titled, Structured Events Are the Basis of Observability. And so we are going to be uh, covering chapters five, six, and seven of the book. Chapter five, Structured Events Are the Building Blocks of Observability, very similar to today's title. Um, chapter six, Stitching Events into Traces and chapter seven, instrumenting with open telemetry. So we're gonna get started by asking like, why did we start with chapters five, six, and seven rather than chapter one? I think that's a brilliant question. But uh, before any of that, we should meet all of today's presenters. Um, so hi, I'm George Miranda, uh, head of ecosystems and uh, partnerships at Honeycomb, uh, co-author of our book. And you can find me on Twitter uh, at gmiranda23. So uh, let's go with intros that are clockwise from this slide. So Charity, I'll hand it over to you. Oh my goodness. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Scrambling to mute. What's my hotkey? Ah. Um, hi, I'm Charity, um, Charity Majors, um, co-founder and CTO of Honeycomb. And I have been working on this book for three whole years. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a weight has been, has been lifted off my shoulder. I kind of can't believe that it's actually over. Like we've said so many times, we're at the end, we're at the home stretch now. Like this is like the last review. No, this is the last draft. And so I, I'm not sure I completely believe that, it, <laughs> that it's actually been published, but here we are. <laughs> it's a living work. If you do find bugs, uh, there is an option to report errata on the O'Reilly website. And I will take care of uh, addressing it for the next print edition. Hi, I'm Liz Fong Jones, and I'm a principal developer advocate at Honeycomb, uh, previously at Google. Um, so you'll hear about this in a little bit. Cherry comes from to the world from the kind of event side of the world and the traces side of the world. I come at, or sorry, the met, uh, and I come at things from the from the metric side of the world. Um, and we collaborated on this wonderful book uh, for three years. Sickles. Yep, I'm Michael Sickles. As you already heard, everyone calls me Sickles. We already have way more than enough Michaels at Honeycomb, so we usually go by our last name, uh, Solutions Architect. So my job will be demoing and presenting how that might look in practice after each of the topics. Cool. Thank you, everybody. I just I just want to say, like, it is real. We actually have like an actual physical printed book. So Charity, we are well, we're done for the first edition, but I'm right there with you. Like, it was just a, a constant iteration. Uh, so uh, I think I said we were going to start with a question of why are we starting with chapters five, six, and seven rather than starting at the beginning? So why, why, why start with structured events being the building blocks of observability? Anybody want to take that one? It's a great I think question. This right? one, um, I, I wanted Charity to tell the story because Charity is the one who kind of really introduced the world to the idea of structured events. And um, this is actually, um, you know, this is both chapters four and five, I think, right? Like the story of how did we realize that structured events are the only way to do things? Yeah, it actually took us about a year and a half to figure this out at Honeycomb. You know, we started by writing the storage engine. And, you know, at, in the beginning, I think we kind of thought of ourselves as just a faster, more efficient, better elk stack. Um, and, and that's really kind of what we, we work. So we're just accepting, you know, structured data, and but, you know, we could slice and dice and query it really well. It took us about a year to realize that the way to instrument was to, you know, initialize an empty honeycomb event when the request enters the service, and then, you know, populate it with a bunch of stuff. And then when it's ready to exit or error, ship it off in that one arbitrarily wide structured data blob, which then contains all of the context, you know, all of the you know everything you know user ids shopping ids um you know headers parameters like everything and 
we it took us it took us a while to realize that that was the key that kind of unlocked the 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 real transformational value of honeycomb because you know once you have those wide events with all of those you know with you know hundred literally hundreds of dimensions per event um, you're able to not only slice and dice by you know high cardinality dimensions and chain multiple high cardinality dimensions together. You you can also like look for outliers and see like what they have in common. Like if you got 500 dimensions wide and you like this is what bubble up does, which you'll see in a bit. You, you're just like oh there's a spike. I care about that. You know draw a little bubble around it and then we'll like we'll like sort and diff, you know, what's different about the dimensions inside the bubble and outside for the baseline. So you get to see, oh, the spike that I care about, all of those errors are maybe going from iOS to this particular version of the build ID to this, you know, language pack to, you know, this region. And th this is how they are different from all the other requests. Um, and if you don't have those wide events, like you can't do that. If you've got logs, they're just spewing out multiple lines per per request. Like you would you would have to like do some post processing to like reconstitute them into one in a one event. So it took us a while, but um, it really like I think of the instrumentation part of Honeycomb as being like a solid third of the magic now. Yeah, and previously, right, like you might have scattered this across multiple different like log lines, right, heaven forbid, or you might have n structured logs and kind of have to grep through, right? And I think what's really interesting about this idea of structured events is that you no longer have to guess as to whether things are temporally correlated or whether they are actually, actually correlated to the same thing. Because if it's all part of the same blob, you can tell that it all happened together as opposed to splinting and like, uh, exactly. did, did that really cause that? Exactly. So I want to I want to I want to back up for a second here. Uh, so uh, Liz and Charity, you've been working on this book for about three years. I've been working on it for about two. So I I, I joined partway through, and I think a lot of what um, uh, I think my role uh, in in the book was is just sort of structuring a narrative and like putting together you know how the different bits of uh, creating an observable stack have come together. And uh, I think, you know, one of the things that we should do for folks joining this, this webinar is um, I didn't, I didn't really want to start with like, what is observability and like, you know, just kind of, you know, this, this definition that, you know, has been a little bit muddied since, you know, the, the phrase observability was coined. Um, we're going to get to that in due time. But today, I think the idea was to start with something concrete, some real technical basis for how can we have a much larger discussion around observability and what it takes to get there and, and sort of what is everything built on, right? And how do we start with fundamentals and, and the things like the, the first principles, right? What are we going to build our understanding of observability on? And so uh, I guess going back to, to the story that you were telling Charity, right? I think one of the things that's important to note is, uh, we're starting with, you know, what is the fundamental unit of information that you need to understand what is happening in your system? Yeah. Right? And if that you're is, buying, yeah. If you're yeah. buying an observability product that isn't based on structured wide events, it's not observability. <laughs> like it just, it just, it, it isn't the way we define it. Um, it doesn't have the capacity to do high, high cardinality, high dimensionality, and the, the sort of slicing and dicing. It's just, it's just metrics with a pretty hat on. I also have to say, if George hadn't joined us, I'm pretty sure Liz and I would be now be embarking on our fourth year of the, of writing this book. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, so let's let's you know maybe without going too far in, right? Talk a little bit about observability and, and what you mean there, right? And I think sort of the way to so the way to encapsulate it is, uh, you know, the, the control uh, theory definition, right? You, you can tell everything about the internal state of a system based on its outputs. It's, it's sort of like, you know, what a lot of folks glom onto with observability. And so our basis for that is basically saying in order to understand any individual state or any possible state that could get, that your system could get into, you have to understand every granular piece of work that that system could do, right? Because then you kind of analyze how all those pieces come together to really you know, solve the mystery of what the hell is happening inside of the system. And so with that, right, the building block is 
what is that granular capture, right, of like the smallest event in a system that you care about? And so structured events, right? Yeah. Start with, uh, you know, start with the record of that. So I don't know, anything that y'all would add to that? When we say small, we don't mean small in terms of number of fields or amount of cardinality, right? We want you to stretch them and make them as wide as possible yeah. to contain all of that context. What we mean by small and granular, though, is kind of the time duration covered, right? Like that you should have every request in and out of your system at minimum covered, which, you know, we'll get to that. And as far as like how you analyze multiple sets of requests together, um, that's kind of coming up next. But in terms of thinking about what's happening inside of your system, kind of that bare minimum has to be, can I understand what my system is inputting and outputting? Um, rather yeah. than aggregating across multiple different requests together into one metric. And what we're comparing this to is, of course, you know, the standard metrics-based, you know, every provider out there, your data dogs and relics, et cetera. Um, the, the source of truth is not a structured wide event. The source of truth is a metric. Uh, and a metric is just a number with some tags appended to it. And, and you can only, you can only actually answer. You can only ask actually ask the questions that you defined um, at right time, right? You can create a custom metric and be like, "I want to ask this question," and you can gather the data that answers that question. But you can't you can't decompose it or add something to it or change it on the fly. Um, you have to you you have to stick with your your original decisions, which is which is why I, I get so sticky about what is and isn't observability because it really comes down to really powerful functionality. And and I guess from a from a functional perspective, right, what that really means is uh, when you are trying to debug the state of your system and you're trying to figure out what is happening, right? If you hit a roadblock where I can't decompose this view any further. Like this is the only information I can get about, you know, what was happening in an aggregate view, right? And like maybe, maybe there's there's a performance problem happening, you know, somewhere inside of this, you know, two seconds represented by this metric. If I can't dig in any further and get down to the individual actions, the individual events that created that number to to, to you know better understand what was happening in the system, that is a lack of observability. Right, like if you are hitting those dead ends, if you cannot decompose to the smallest actions that you care about, then that is not an observable system, right? And so I think the 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 basis of this chapter is the idea that um, in order to be able to understand anything, right, you need a granular enough unit. We believe that that is the the arbitrarily wide event. And you need an exploratory interface that allows you to combine and recombine at, as you want. Interestingly, right, which is what distinguishes this this is what distinguishes kind of traditional logging, right? Like JSON structured logging has been around for ages, right? And I think that that provides some of those properties of the structured events, but as Charity was about to say, it does not provide the exploratory analysis. Um I was also about to I was going to say something completely different. Now it's, I've forgotten it. Sorry. Sorry for interrupting. You, oh, oh uh, in the, uh, since we've done all this work, I, I've actually learned that AWS um, does a lot of their internal um, tooling via arbitrarily wide structured data blobs that are stored just in plain text in a file in the root file system. And they do basically like a dish, like a distributed shell effectively to parallelize to just gather that information. And, and, and so that actually made me feel great. <laughs> if, if AWS came up with the same thing, I think, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's kind of this minimum viable product, right? Like you don't have to be super sophisticated like we are at Honeycomb to start writing this structured event yeah, frame, right? Like you can, can get start better. with JSON logs. People can get better observability than, than they get with metrics-based products just by, you know, just by making these fat, you know, arbitrary wide structured data blobs and piping them into anything, <laughs> anything. Um, or even like if you're AWS, right? Like what Charity said, they leave them on the root file system, right? Like yeah. you don't have to centrally index them as long as you have the ability to at query time, yeah. slice and dice them. Kind of the centralized indexing is almost a little bit of a trap. So we'll get to that later. But um, do we maybe want to transition over and have uh, Sickles uh, show us kind of what that looks like? 
Let's do it. I think this is a perfect time, uh, especially as you're talking about slicing and dicing. We're talking about structured events. Let's show how that actually looks in Honeycomb. So I'm going to go ahead and steal the screen here. And I should be able to share this one. You should see my screen now. Thank you. So for context, we have a microservices demo platform. This is basically Google's microservices demo. Uh, it's a 10 service application. It's running in our EKS cluster. It's in front, uh, we have an ALB in front of it to serve your request. And so what we've done here is we hooked up our ALB logs from AWS using one of the Honeycomb integrations to start asking questions about like that front facing data. How that looks though, we talk about structured JSON it really is just that. So when uh, an event comes into Honeycomb, it's just a whole bunch of key value pairs. So we have different types of attributes and questions we might wanna ask about those attributes. So here we can see the action that was executed. We can see the status code. We can see the specific request that was made to the front end. And now we need to start like parsing that in some way. And so one of my favorite queries to run in Honeycomb uh, takes me back to when I was a developer. Uh, I used to sift through the logs. That's how I used to do things. And it was structured logs. And I go, okay, well, I see a spike in my errors. What's going on? Well, let me just grep the 500s and start figuring out what is that commonality. And so in this case here, you can see I've done this heat map on this status code. And I'm grouping by request. It's once again, these are just different dimensions, this structured information. And we can start seeing the request here. But I see that there's this band of 500s here. And so in Honeycomb, I can just select it. And the key thing is with that high cardinality information, we're going to analyze that's the attributes. The, in this case, this is logs in that selected area. And we're going to compare it to the attributes in the blue non-selected area. And we're going to bubble up to you, basically doing that grep on the 500s for you uh, and helping you understand like where you should look. So in this case, I can see right away that there's this one request that is happening with the 500s. And you can see this little break me now at the end of it. And we kind of intentionally break it for our demo environment, but there's tons of other details in here. So this status code is 500. We can see the user agent. We can see most of this is coming from this Python request because this is a, a load gener, right? So that's, yeah, structured We're also seeing Honeycomb. this interesting thing, right? Like, you know, this is just the raw ELB logs, right? Like this is no fancy instrumentation. This is literally just the Honeycomb uh, E ELB, ALB agent, right, scraping the logs in. It turns out that Amazon already produces these structured wide event blobs for you. Granted, they're a little bit less wide than we would like, right? Like, they don't have any application metadata. But what I think is really cool is, like, I as an operator, right, like, you know, I'm on call for Honeycomb, and I like to figure out often, like, you know, if my ALBs are serving 500s, sometimes it comes from the app. And sometimes it comes from there being no serving app backends, right? So by being seeing, you know, yes, the ELB status code was 500, but the fact that it's highlighting there that the target status code is also 500, right? That tells me the backend is misbehaving. That tells me not that I'm missing backends, right? Like there is so much insight that you can get just from parsing this visual representation of all the fields, right? You can see proportionally how much of the control group versus the experiment group or the control group versus uh, the failure group, how the data differs, right? What are the fields that are populated in each? I think that that is much, much, much more powerful than just repping, right? We don't call this machine learning, right? Like, you know, we would have all the AI and, mar and ML marketing buzzwords if we called this machine learning. But I think what is really neat about this is that it synthesizes the kind of best of what machines can do and giving you the context as a human to understand the properties of your system. So I think this is a great demo. I think it really, you know, starts to you know show that uh, really what you need, right? Those those arbitrarily wide blobs, and at at a fundamental level, right, that can just be a log, right? It can be a, ALB logs in this example, right? So uh, I'm going to share my screen again. Sorry, I've lost slides there for a minute. Um, and I think one of the things that that I find interesting about starting in this approach is that. Um, before we start talking about like what observability actually is, um, one of the things that you know I, I think we commonly come up against, right, is you know the the three pillars definition of observability, right? There should be logs, metrics, and traces. Um, and really, I think you know what what matters here is at, <laughs> the fundamental block is that structured data, 
right? And it turns out that that structured data type, you can derive traces and metrics from those structured blobs as well. So uh, I don't know, uh, it, it's not just the uh, telemetry, although really what we are talking about in this session today is just gathering telemetry. It's how we uh, gain insights from that telemetry, right? How we use tools like Bubble Up, how we do investigation, and we will talk about those things uh, in further depth as we look at other chapters. But today specifically, when it comes to uh, events and telemetry and logs, metrics or traces, I don't know, how do you how do you all start thinking about that, Liz or Charity? So here's where Charity and I come from dueling perspectives. So I worked at Google for 11 years, right? Like Google is a hardcore metrics shop, right? We, we built this amazing um, medium cardinality uh, metrics tool called Monarch that let you interactively slice and dice. But the thing that it did not necessarily let you do was uh, get all the way down to correlating multiple high cardinality dimensions at the same time. Um, so that's actually part of what I found amazing about Honeycomb was the ability to ask those kinds of questions about high cardinality data for the first time. Um, but I think what's really interesting is you can squint and look at Google's metrics model and you can realize that what Google was doing with metrics, with medium cardinality metrics and sampled trace exemplars is instead, in, instead you can flip, the, flip it around and say, you know what, this is a sampled high cardinality event with a, with a sample rate attached, right? So in the fancy Google heat maps I was looking at that said, you know, for this individual user, right? User being a medium cardinality dimension to us, you know, you had five events that happened, you know, that were between 100 and 150 milliseconds that happened in this five minute window. When you squint and look at it, you realize that that's actually, you could record one wide event during that time period and say, this was sampled one for five. And that that is the same thing. It's just expressed in the honeycomb events world as opposed to the uh, Google uh, metrics histograms world, that they're, that they're two sides of the same coin. Um, so I think that these things are not necessarily incompatible. I think that it just requires being clever about how you conceptualize these things. But why be clever about it? Why not just do events in the first place? That's kind of how I think about kind of contrasting metrics from, from, from events. We didn't actually have traces or tracing in the beginning. Um, I think the first question that came up had to do with tracing. I, I've been meaning to mention this. Um, who was that from? That was from uh, James, James DeVille. Um, yeah, so it, in the beginning, like we, we, were, we were just focused on these wide events. And it was about a year and a half later, one of our engineers was like, you know, these could be traces if we just app appended like a span ID and a trace ID and, and we just propagated them through. And, uh, <laughs> and we're like, that's, that's true. That's amazing. We should totally do that. And so tracing kind of got bolted on later. And we've had, had a lot of conversations about, you know, like, do we charge or do we, you know, how, how to do spans and how to compute them. And, and I wouldn't even say that we've, really landed on the final solution here. There's a lot of kind of advanced trace querying stuff that we really want to do that hasn't hasn't landed yet. That's going to be pretty dope. Like the, the amazing thing though about the Honeycomb storage engine is that it just, it's so different from everything else out there and it just keeps giving and giving and giving. Like every time we want to build something, it's like, oh my God, we can do this so easily. And it's, and it's cost effective and it's, you know, and it, it lets us do these really, fancy things and like just time after time like and i and i know that this isn't an advantage this this advantage will not last forever because i know that our competitors are out there you know trying to build the same functionality yeah. it, um, it turns red it's great you know i i love to see more competition um I, datadog announced absolutely. um datadog announced i think this week that they had built a high cardinality column store finally welcome to the club um I, I think this yeah. is that what's interesting yeah. here, though, is when we talk about um, when we talk about you know this evolution from logging and wide events to to tracing, right? Like the fundamental manifestation of that is grouping by request ID, right? Or grouping by request ID, right? So many of us have done that in the past, and tracing just makes that more explicit. 
and it just you can visualize it that's the power of tracing to me like you can look at logs all day long and you're not going you're you're not going to be able to catch these trends and these patterns the way that your eye will if you if you're just graphing them that way it's like you know we used to be able to use debuggers we could if all else failed you could detach a debugger and step through it in production you can't do that anymore because you've got microservices and it's just hopping <laughs> hopping the network all over uh, I kind of think of um, honeycomb in a way as um, being a distributed s trace because <laughs> it lets you just pack up the context and and do your tracing I think the 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 eye-opening part for me um when I started diving into the world of of the of observability can't say those two words together um is that uh you know when looking at the event as the fundamental building block, you know, uh, the, my my issue with sort of the, the three pillars of observability is defined is it's not just the telemetry that you have, it's, you know, how you analyze it and like what you do with it. However, if we are talking about just telemetry, those definitions aren't necessarily wrong, right? Like, yes, tracing matters and like logging matters and like your metrics matter. Um, but these are all actually the same fundamental data type, right? Like Charity was alluding to, um, structured logs, right? Just add a parent ID and a span ID and a trace ID and like make sure it's got a duration and a timestamp and like, cool, tracing, right? Tracing is just a series of interconnected logs and metrics, you could just add up all the events in a specified time period and get the metric calculation to figure out what your metric would have been for this time period. And that yeah. is, yeah, that's, that's the thing, right? So at, at its core, what we have is the fundamental building block that you need to understand every bit of your system is based on the event, right? And these distinctions that we make about data types are completely arbitrary and they kind of get in the way of understanding your system holistically because then as a, you know, as an engineer, right? I start thinking, oh, I need a tracing tool. I need a logging tool or I need a metrics tool. And you don't, yeah. right? You just need yeah. a data store that has all of your events and then you can kind of compose these things on and the fly you as you need. To understand. You can yeah. derive every data type that you need from the wide event. Yeah, yeah it's it's sure. all manifestations of the data. You can't go in and, the other direction. <laughs> yeah, the trap that you <laughs> fall into if you go the other way is you're now paying to store your data three different times in three different ways. And then also you have inconsistency between the data types, right? That spike that turns up in your in your in your logging tool might be missed by your metrics tool because the P99 from the five minute window, oh, that didn't spike because you know you didn't have 1% of your requests that were slower than this, right? Or your tracing tool might sample away the data that you need, right? Like, so there's this challenge of when you try to, you know, fit three tools in the budget that one tool should be fulfilling, right? That just means that you are doing three shittier part of my language, you're doing three shittier versions of, of what should really just be one, one data store. So I think that's probably a great transition into maybe uh, seeing what this looks like a little bit in practice, Sickles. I don't know, what, yeah. do, what do you got for us? Gonna go ahead and steal the screen again. I've got a couple of screens here, uh, basically segmenting the, the different types of data. We saw logs, metrics, and traces, but at its core, it really is just structured information. Here we have an individual trace. This is a one request for one of our users on our microservices demo. And you can see that the benefit of a waterfall view or having this visual view is it's really easy to quickly and derive patterns, right? So for example, I can see that the majority of time was spent uh, on this get discounts function. And then I can also see below it it called the database a whole bunch of times. And that's an interesting thing to be able to pull out in context. So I can see the, the lead up to it. And at its core, this all has structured information on it. So if I come over here and put this trace dot field, it's got this, this request ID. Uh, when I was a developer, it, it was exactly that. You put the request ID to grab on to pull out and it's, it's a collection of events. In this case, it's a trace ID. A span ID to say it's myself and a parent ID to say who called me. And you get this connective glue together. Finally, also just adding in a duration. And now you can see how long different pieces actually took. And so that this is how we at Honeycomb glue together. There's a way to set up this definitions. We automatically pick this information up out of the box typically to, to build this waterfall view for you from your data. 
And then you can start doing even more things, right? So we talk about structured logs and, and logging data. And there is a way to potentially show your logging data in a trace view. So for example, in here, you'll see, I have this almost like a log here. So it's called a span event. And span event is an open telemetry concept, which we'll get to in a moment, a little bit later. Uh, it's a log line on a span. So I, I do have this prepared, this charge. It's a certain point in time, this happened kind of event. And you can glue it together to a trace by just one extra attribute, this meta dot annotation type field. And now we can- uh, Sickles, click on the uh, span events tab uh, on the right-hand side, right? And you can see that all of these have all of the full feature set of a, of a arbitrary wide JSON blob, right? It's just stored right there, but it's tucked out of the way because it's not necessarily as meaningful as the duration when you're trying to understand where did I spend my time. But once you see that thing that's potentially problematic and you want to zoom in, you can zoom all the way in. Yeah. And what we also find is for our, a lot of our customers who start doing this, this, I think span events are a great bridge between how you might take some existing logging and attach it to your tracing. There's different ways you might use a log appender to pull that trace ID uh, in, from the process itself. But you can also take sometimes this structured information and just attach it to the span itself. Like it's structured data. Hey, this pod name, let me just put it on here or uh, user ID, which I have you know, over on some of these spans. And I, I have this user, well, this is user agent, right? So you can attach that information. You might not need some of those log lines, honestly. You can actually get away with and, and have more value of having it on the span itself because it's closer to the work that's being done. Right, and this goes back to what we were just talking about in the previous section about the wider you make your things and the fewer of them you emit, the better, right? Instead of having, you know, a log line that says got here or a log line that says, you know, this is my user ID, by the way. Right. If you roll that all up into one set of attributes on one request, that makes it better. And the other secret thing, by the way, uh, Sickles, if you want to go back out of the trace view, uh, if you back out of the trace view and hit the raw data view, right? What I want to demonstrate to you is that at the end of the day, if you want to look at this data as if you were looking at it, you know, as a set of columns and rows, right? Like at, like an Excel spreadsheet or like a you know well structured uh, log. You can do that, right? Like it's just raw data. We happen to visualize it as a trace waterfall because it's easier and more convenient for you to visually parse. But if you want to see, at, you know, in this tabular view, you can get the tabular view. Yeah. So there's not a requirement to use a span event to get the logging, right? You can, assuming that you have a trace ID and span ID, you can just say, I'm just going to make these part of my uh, trace and I can still look at, at like a log if I want to. So what I, what, I, what I want to add to that is when I when I discovered distributed tracing prior to coming to Honeycomb, I always thought of it in the context of service to service communication, right across like a distributed system. And the, I think the thing that was you know mind opening about you know seeing structured events as, as the building block is that you can assemble a trace view out of anything that you need, right? Any arbitrary cohesive action you want to understand in your system you can build the trace view out of, right? Just by interconnecting a number of logs. We're gonna talk about this later when we look at build events and using uh, observability inside your CI CD pipelines as one example of where you can do that, right? But any unit of work that you want to break down and understand what is happening at each step of the way, right? You can build a trace out of if you are using events as the building block to understand what is happening in your system. Um, I'm also going to point out one other thing that is in the comments uh, in chat, which Charity mentioned there's a sticker behind her that says 20 fucking tools and no two of them agree, right? And that is one, I think, yeah, and like looking at the response, something that everybody can relate with, right? Which is when you separate these data types, right, to understand different aspects of your system, you're duplicating views, you're losing context between them. And what is fundamental to observability is if you're going to cohesively understand your system, have one shared fundamental building block that all views are derived from, and that keeps the shared context, and it keeps you from you know that that situation where you know you've got twenty different views of things and no two of them agree because they're all using separate data sets. So yeah, let's let's I actually want to show like that in a, in another way. Uh, because this is cool. something that I'm passionate about is you get this single pane of glass, right? This is all the tools out there, single pane of glass. It's just marketing speak. Uh, I disagree. A lot of the times you find with those products, actually, it's, it's multiple panes in the same house, 
right? So you're, you're actually, you're going to a separate database section. You're going to a separate server information section. You're going to these different sections and then you're forced to make those jumps and glue them together. Whereas in Honeycomb, it, it really is everything. That raw event is the structure for everything. In this case, maybe it's metrics, right? So if I open up one of these events on the metrics pane, you know, it's structured information. Here's my individual values for my metrics. And then I have different labels to describe it. Well, if I now take my tracing labels and combine them with my metrics labels, I can come in here and I'm running, so once again, just this one same spot, a query of my duration group by, in this case, it's by pod. And I have these different metrics that I care about for my pods. And I see, huh, this checkout service is having a weird day. I'm going to go ahead and just filter on it. And now I'm applying my filters across everything. And now I'm just looking at my one checkout service pod and all the data, whether it's tracing data over down here or my metrics data and one actual true view together. Yeah, I think it's really, really mind blowing when you when you actually like play with the query builder. Uh, in fact, Sickles, why don't you add in uh, not just the heat map, right? Let's compute like a P50 of the duration and also maybe let's show the max of the memory utilization. So P50 of duration. Right, so we're computing that metric on the fly, uh, right, like that that uh, scalar value on the fly based off of all of the trace data that we got before, right? That P50 of duration, we just computed for, for every time bucket. Right, across and all you can go those eligible. even higher cardinality, right? Like if I wanted to, I can have my 50, P50s by individual users. That's just something that you can't do in a traditional like metrics based system because it gets aggregated away versus here. I can just on the fly, oh, I want to group by maybe this user ID and, and see if I have maybe high priority customers that I really want to focus in on. Perfect. Well, uh, let's oh, talk about how to generate demo. that data maybe, right? Yes, and I'm struggling with live here. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I want to actually just emphasize before we go further, right, that um, in this series as a whole, we're going to be talking about observability and engineering and everything that it takes to get there, right? And I don't want to lose sight of the fact that, as we just saw in the demo, right, being able to calculate any view that you need to, you know, figure out what's happening in your system is an absolute critical part of having observability. Today, we're mostly talking about the building block and the event, right? And sort of the telemetry that you need in order to, to build an observable system because that is the foundation, um, but it's not the only thing that you need, right? So even though we're focusing on that, you know, in, in the coming sessions, we're gonna look at a lot more of, of the analysis capabilities and what you need, but going back to telemetry, yeah, how do you start generating all of this, right? We've been talking about uh, open telemetry kind of uh, around our demos, um, I don't know. Well, well, how do you want to kick off the conversation around open telemetry? I think this goes back to um, tracing SDKs, right? Um, maybe Charity, why don't you talk through why we wrote the beelines to begin with and kind of what that dialogue looked like when we started thinking about adopting open telemetry and what that journey has looked like over the past three years, really? Yeah, totally. Um, well, I, I would say that we finally reached product market fit in 2019, 20, yeah, early 2019, as a result of two things. And this was like, we were founded beginning of 2016. So this was like three years of wandering the wilderness. Um, but the two things that we built that uh, kind of made it click and helped us start getting users were um, a kind of APM home type of landing page that you know, we, we used to pop people straight into the query builder and a lot of people were just like, ah, terrified and ran away. Um, so, we, so we made like a landing page, just had the, the same three graphs as you get everywhere, right? Latency, errors, and request, request rate. And the second thing that we did was the beelines. So we've always been, you know, really impressed by uh, the New Relic signup experience. It's clear that they spent a lot of time focusing on, you know, the first 30 seconds of getting going. Like it's so smooth, it's so automatic. Um, and in fact, we knew we couldn't compete with that. Um, so for the first few years, we were really specifically targeting um, users of Datadog and New Relic who had already run into the limitations of those platforms and who were then, you know, willing to do a little extra work because they knew that they needed to do stuff that, you know, we could support and those other platforms couldn't. Um, but around 2019, we were like, okay, it's, it's too hard to get started. We have to do 
you know, especially since we had realized that we needed to do, you know, the complicated initiate, initiate, initialize an event, populate it, you know, exit near, that was just too much to expect people to do on their own. Very few people did. Um, so we did the beelines that would do all of that magic for you. And you could really just do like a, a you know, gem install or NPM install for the beeline. And you would get basically instrumentation on parity with, you know, anyone else. Now, for us, that was still kind of shitty instrumentation because you only got like what, maybe a couple dozen dimensions. And, you know, we couldn't like, this is the thing. It's, it's like instrumentation is just like commenting. Um, if you auto generate it, it's not going to be very worthwhile. It's only going to give you the absolute basics. What you really want is to use commenting and instrumentation to capture your original intent where you're like, ah, I'm doing this. This matters, right? Stuff that in the blob. Uh, I'm doing this. This, this is going to help me find something in the future, right? As you're writing your code, you should be instrumenting with an eye towards, you know, your future self is going to need to understand this because, you know, we could just like gather all the variables and stuff them into the blob. And that would just be overwhelming and stupid, right? Like too much data can be just as bad as too little. Um, so, you know, with the beelines, you could get started, you could get something usable in, in just, you know, a couple seconds. And then it created the, the framework where you, it was just like a printf every time you wanted to stuff something into the blob, just like printf, stuff it on the blob. And, and that was a huge help for our users. And um, that's kind of what got us off the ground. And shortly after Liz started, um, she started, you know, talking about open telemetry, which, you know, we, we were keeping an eye on for sure. Um, and, you know, we, we sat her, it's a really big bet for us to make, you know, we had to make sure that it was going to be worth it. We, were, we had to make sure that enough people were going to pick it up because unfortunately it is kind of a step backwards in terms of ease of use and ease of getting started. And, and it does mean we're lashing our future to, you know, open source and a bunch of other people, you know, contributing to it. Um, and, you know, we had to make sure that, you know, okay, it's fine if the function out, if it's fine if the experience of getting started is a little bit crappier, but we had to make sure that it wouldn't nerf the actual power of, of Honeycomb, right? Like, like if they were only sending in like, like not wide events or if they had nerfed them in some way. So you know, it took us about a year um, and, um, and uh, then we decided to adopt it because we do believe that, that it is the future. You know, I think personally, I think this is long overdue. I've been bitching about the lack of an open standard for years now. There were open like, standards. There were two of them. That was the problem, right? Like that's why Honeycomb yeah, went and developed. There the wasn't, was, it wasn't it clear whether open anything. census or open, it wasn't clear whether open census or open tracing was yeah. when you win. Yeah. And yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, so, yeah, yeah, I, I think, think the only, go ahead, Liz. I, I think that's, that was really the magical moment, right? Like when the answer is both open census and open tracing one in that we merged the projects together, open census and open tracing are both sunset. And now we have open telemetry as kind of the one vendor neutral way that multiple vendors are collaborating on, which yeah, gives you freedom hope, of choice. The hope is that, you know, vendors will cooperate and make it so that, you know, so that the customer wins so that you can, switch between providers without having to re-instrument your entire stack because who the fuck wants to do that? Nobody. So there's a lot of lock-in, vendor lock-in because, you know, nobody, <laughs> it's just work that nobody's going to do unless, you know, they really have to. Um, unfortunately, I don't know if you've been following me on Twitter, <laughs> uh, our biggest competitor, Datadog, has elected to um, not <laughs> add that functionality. They'll let you get your data in, but they won't instrument the parts that let you get your data off if you want to try someone else, which is pretty shady, I think. Um, somebody actually wrote the software, the diff that um, that would have made this happen, and they strong-armed him into closing it. <laughs> so uh, if you're a Datadog customer, knock on their door, tell them that you support open standards, and this is not acceptable. <laughs> Yeah. When it, when uh, it comes to, open to, standards. to be fair, they, they have hired my friend Gordon Radley, and I am excited to have uh, Datadog engineers under Gordon's leadership contribute to open telemetry. But it's That's not nice. the, the fruits of that I'll are not there yet. I see some actual progress. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but yeah, you know, I think for us, open telemetry was transformative because it lowered the barrier to people instrumenting their code, right? Previously, you know, yes, we had some people who were using B lines who were happy with them. Oh, it raised it raised the barrier for instrumenting your code by a lot. I, technically, 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 yes. Organizationally, yes, no, is. right? <laughs> open telemetry is generic, right? Like it supports everything, which means you have to provide very specific instructions to configure it to send to Honeycomb. But the organizational barrier is that people no longer fear adding and ripping out telemetry because they know that it's future proof and that they don't have to add it and rip it out multiple times, right? I am really looking forward to the day when this becomes a net positive for us. Um, it's not there yet. <laughs> But I, I, I do think the increased possible. integration ecosystem is a net positive, right? That that the open telemetry ecosystem supports more auto instrumentation than right, like our team of solutions engineers could put together on it's, our own. So it supports it, but it doesn't actually have it. So yeah, not very yet. You know, this, this is this is evolving, right? Like you know, we have um, this is why, for instance, in addition to our one chapter of open telemetry, uh, we highly recommend Alex Bowden of Lightsteps uh, book on kind of the nitty gritty of instrumentation of auto of the open it telemetry. It was released at the same time as ours. And, and it goes into more depth because like we spent three years writing the book, we could only focus one chapter on this and it was such a moving target. Like even trying to make that one chapter stick was challenging. So on that note, Michael, why don't you, Sickles, why don't you show us kind of what the current standard of open telemetry uh, look, instrumentation looks like? Yeah, let me go ahead and share my screen one more time here on how it looks in practice. Do, do, do. Share over here. Uh, so this should look familiar. We're here at our home screen. We have some in interesting information here. Once again, if I click in through, we have uh, this heat map and I could you know, bubble up and I can start asking information about it. You'll see typically in open telemetry out of the box, certain common attributes. So for example, for HTTP calls, you'll see this HTTP target. You'll see things like the user agent. You'll see things like um, error status code, this net PRIP. And so actually one way we can actually just interestingly ask questions about that. I'm gonna clear some of these filters uh, and just look at account here. And so if I go here, Library.name exists. These are the different packages that are being pulled out automatically and do that, that auto instrumentation piece. It's really great. I think auto instrumentation is great for common libraries use. So things like HTTP calls, great. Uh, database calls, great. Because a lot of the, you know, Microsoft SQL or MySQL, those are commonly used. We already have the experience and you, you'll see the same attributes across everything. So open telemetry has this thing called semantic conventions so that if you're making a database call, it should have this database.name field or this database.statement field so that it's not disjointed. It's all the same attribute name. And then you're going to want to add in extra details. So for example, uh, in this instrumentation here, we have this user ID field. So if I just come in here and group by user ID, and we now have questions about user. How did we add that? It's really easy. So I'm gonna just show our docs here. We have the different SDKs. So for example, uh, I'll just come to the, the Java one here. And it's literally just one line to grab the current span, one line to add that attribute. That's it. So now I can ask questions about this user.id field. Uh, and then there's ways to even abstract it out. I've seen plenty of customers where they have like. Sickles, a you may want to zoom in on that. People on the uh, on on the uh, webinar may have oh. trouble seeing. There we go. Uh, what is this <laughs> docs page for ants? And maybe and selected the contrast is a uh, a little lacking. We should fix that. There we go. Yep. But yeah, it, it, this is very common across all the languages. It's it's you have a way to grab the current span. So that's to hook into the auto instrumentation, and then you just add in an attribute you want to get details. And then you can even break it down. So maybe you get one span from the auto instrumentation that you want to break into smaller pieces. It's just creating a new span and then ending it. Add in the details if you need to add those details. And so uh, with that, uh, that is getting towards the top of the hour. I want to leave a little bit of time for Q&A. 
Uh, uh, I'll just I'll point do. out, if you can see it in the book, lots of code samples to show you uh, what it's like to work with open telemetry. So again, uh, observability engineering, O'Reilly, the book is out now. Uh, we'll paste some links for how to get that in, in the, uh, in the chat. And also, uh, again, when it comes to the author's cut series, uh, today we were just talking about the fundamental building block and using events, uh, in the coming, uh, uh webinars, we'll be talking about, uh, functionally, how do you know you have observability? What kinds of problems do you need to solve? How does that compare to monitoring? Ways to analyze the data um, and lots more. So there's a link in the chat as well to sign up for uh, the webinar series if you are interested. And so that's most of what we have time for today. And I wanna thank Liz, Charity and Sickles for joining us. Uh, we've gotten a lot of questions in the Q&A and we have a few minutes, so we'll take as many of those as we can. So also just a reminder um, that the link to watch this webinar will be in your inbox soon. So please feel free to share that link uh, if you liked today's content. Uh, so with that, uh, let's get to some of the questions. Uh, can I take uh, Daniel Golan's question maybe? Go ahead. So Daniel Golan asks, uh, what does adopting white events eliminate? Can you really turn off some of your other things? Um, and I think the answer is white events with open telemetry um, kind of solves a number of these challenges. Um, where for instance, yes, you can feature flag adding additional logging or adding additional fields, but the better option is to use the open telemetry collector to keep or drop certain fields when sending them to different sinks. And that way you're recording all the data in high fidelity. And ideally, your backend should support it, right? If you send it to Honeycomb, we don't charge you per field. But if you do need to send high cardinality data uh, to somewhere else and you want to drop the high cardinality from it, you can do that with the open telemetry collectors. So it kind of provides that deduplication of your telemetry generation. And it also solves that problem of, you know, how do I generate this wide event? How do I keep track of all these attributes? Well, you don't have to worry about it. That's just shoved in the span context, which just lives in your process. And open telemetry handles that. Let's see, I'm um, looking for other questions in the chat. <laughs> Who picked the animal for the cover? Um, uh, Liz, Charity, and we don't want to take that one. You want to talk about the maimed wolf? Uh, yeah, so they first, they first offered us a fish and Liz made her peace with it. I did not. There's just the fish has hexagonal that. scales and it had eyes that were big for observing. I thought it was great. It was not cuddly. It was not fierce. It, it was a fish and I did not, I felt no emotional attachment to it whatsoever. Um, so I, I pinged them and I said, I know that we don't get to pick the animal, but I kind of hate this one. Is there anything you can do? And, and they're like, we don't let people choose. But how about a wolf? <laughs> so. We, we, have, we have uh, stickers coming in too that will let you give them little red glitter booties and like my little ponytails and tiaras and stuff. So if you've got a, a hard copy of the book, um, send me your address and I'll, I'll, I'll get one to you. <laughs> Press it up. Uh, here's another question. Um, how does Otel auto instrumentation compare to, ex to existing vendor auto instrumentation? So whether a Beeline or you know, New Relic, uh, APM or Datadog, are they all pretty much on par or do you get the best value by going beyond it? So Datadog donated a lot of their auto instrumentation to uh, OpenTelemetry at the start of the project. We're very grateful to them, to them for that. Um, we wish that they'd continued upstream their work, but that kind of one-off donation meant that you know, there was parity with many of the Datadog integrations. And then we've had contributions from many vendors beyond that as well. Um, so definitely, you know, there are some languages where we feel beelines are uh, have have more comprehensive coverage. But in most languages, it's at par, and it's just you know, it's there's difficulty in in configuring the Otel SDK out of the box, which is why we have Otel distributions. So there's an Otel distribution for Java by Honeycomb. Um, that bundles the hotel uh, base distro and configures it to auto send to Honeycomb. Yeah, I think one of the things that I wanted to add earlier in the conversation was when Charity said that it was a little bit of a step backwards, right? It's yes, you have a generic open standard as opposed to a vendor library that is, you know, set up to 
add the instrumentation that you need for the dashboards that they're going to show you in a very slick, cohesive way, right? Um, but I think part of what's solving that problem are the distributions for a particular vendor, right? That are built on top of OpenTelemetry that give you some of the extra polish that you might need, like when using it for Honeycomb, right? Or when using OpenTelemetry for AWS, right? Or for, you know, blank distribution. Um, so I think that's, you know, kind of a, a way to get the best of both worlds. I think maybe we have time for one last question. Let me see if anything else has come into chat. Our hotel agent, Brett's question. Go ahead. Uh, I'm hoping Sickles will answer, actually. What's the question? I have to, there's a lot of scroll. Uh, do you have an, do you use the OTEL agent? Do you have your own kind of what combination do you recommend people use? So yeah, we do have our own distribution for open telemetry for Java and .NET. We're working on Go next, I believe. Uh, we at Honeycomb ourselves, I know use a combination of B-lines, our old stuff and uh, open telemetry. We're kind of making a shift and using both in like a interesting hybrid way. Uh, our recommendation, though, is going to be open telemetry. Our beelines, while we'll continue to support, they're in maintenance mode. So if there is any dependency pr problems, you know, we'll update the dependencies, but don't expect any new like libraries added to that auto instrumentation. Versus open telemetry, they're adding new instrumentations all the time. So that's why we would recommend open telemetry. And lastly, right. there are like Honeycomb ALB agents, right? You saw the Honeycomb ALB agent at the start. That's not OTEL. Um, that's just importing ALB logs. So we think that works great if you're just looking for the kind of native AWS integrations. Well, thank you, everybody. I know that that brings us to the top of the hour. There was a lot of content that we covered today. So uh, uh, just a reminder, uh, we value your feedback. And so if you complete a survey about this webinar and let us know what you think, we'll send you a free t-shirt to say thank you. So that is all that we have time for today. Again, we have a couple of upcoming events uh, in the webinar series. So please, we hope uh, you will check those out and join us again in the future. Uh, with that, again, I wanna say thank you to our presenters and thank you everyone for joining us. Have a happy week, everyone.